So what should we make of these earthquakes in California? Is God trying to speak to the people of that state? It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. You want to be very careful... I want to be very careful when we speak for God. It's one thing when we quote Scripture. It's one thing when we say, well, here's what's written. It's another thing where we give our interpretation of events around us or seek to understand what God is saying or doing. We should tread carefully. So I ask this question with care and reverence. Is God seeking to get the attention of the people of California with these earthquakes. This is Michael Brown. Welcome to the Line of Fire. To weigh in, give your point of view, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. A bunch of other things we will cover today. The Starbucks incident, if you haven't heard about that, where policemen were asked to leave because a customer felt unsafe in their presence. We'll talk about that. My most recent article, which talks about the rise of witches yet again in America. And if we have time as well, Amazon's book banning going in a very dangerous direction. If you have a question you want to raise to me or some other comment subject you want to bring up, I may get to random calls as well. Not random for you, but random for me. 866-348-7884. For years, people, Christian, different ones who feel California is heading in a very wrong direction, have been saying, you watch, there's going to be a big earthquake and, and California is going to fall into the sea. You watch, California is going to be devastated by an earthquake. And if you go back to the turn of this century, I'll, I'll just type in the words, uh, let's see, I'm going to type in the words, San Francisco earthquake, Okay. San Francisco earthquake, and let's see what comes up. San Francisco earthquake, now we have, there's 1989, et cetera. There are recent ones now, but 1906, yeah, 1906, 80% of the destruction of the buildings in the San Francisco earthquake were caused by the Great Fire. The two tectonic plates that interacted to cause the 1906 San Francisco earthquake were the Pacific Plate, North American Plate. I bring that up because there was a fiery preacher named Maria Woodworth Etter. Some would say her name is pronounced Mariah Woodworth Etter. And she spoke of an earthquake coming to California and devastation. And then you have the San Francisco earthquake not long after. That gets your attention. But can we draw conclusions from the two fairly substantial earthquakes in the last few days, what around seven or higher on the Richter scale, and the question of will there be more earthquakes like this, or is there a bigger one looming? Is this just natural phenomena? In other words, this is the way it's structured. This is the way California is structured under the ground. You've got these plates, and, and if they shift a certain way, you have an earthquake. There's nothing mystical. There's nothing magical. There's nothing spiritual about it. Or would you say, well, who is it that set that in place in, in the first place? Who is it that, that structured the, the world a certain way? Or do you say, look, we don't understand why these things happen, but we believe that God is speaking through everything, that he's sovereign, Or do you say, no, I think it's the devil who wants to destroy lies. Remember, he did terrible things to Job. I imagine that would be the most minority position of those listening and watching today. But what's your take on this? Should should we take spiritual stock because of these earthquakes? Should we step back and say, God, are you speaking to the people of California? So as always, I asked on Twitter for feedback from my uh, my followers there. Now, remember, this is not meant to prove anything. This is just meant to solicit opinions, all right? So here's my question on Twitter. 
Is God trying to get the attention of the people of California through these earthquakes? What's your take? Okay, just leave that up on the screen for a moment. When I say is God trying to get the attention of the people of California, you might say, well, God is God. He does what he wants to do. Yes, I understand that, that God is God and he does what he wants to do. But for example, through the prophet Jeremiah, he said, I, I, I'm constantly sending the prophets to you. I'm calling you. I'm calling you. Uh, Moses said, if only you would listen to the commandments. Uh, you have a similar verse in Isaiah, God saying, if only. In other words, God desires many things, but he doesn't make them happen. He desires that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, but he doesn't make that happen. He desires that we would all repent and walk in intimacy with him, but he doesn't make that happen. So by trying, I don't mean that God is is is, is beating the air in a futile way and, and oh well, he's trying hard, oh, but he really can't. Do. No, no, I mean, is God seeking to work through this? And whether people listen or not is another question. Whether they heed what he's saying or not is another question. Nathan just posted on Facebook, nothing happens outside of the will of God. Many would hold to that same view, saying, well, if there is an earthquake or a hurricane or a beautiful day, that's the doing of God. What happens in the world around us is the doing of God. And that insurance companies that refer to certain things like acts of God, that those are accurate descriptions. Just like a beautiful day is an act of God, a thunderstorm is an act of God. Some would hold to that view. Well, it still doesn't answer the question, is there a divine intent in it? Is God seeking to get the attention of the people of California through the earthquake? So I, I gave four choices. Obviously, how ridiculous. It's a possibility. Who knows? All right, so chew on that for a second. Four choices. Is God trying to get the attention of the people of California through these earthquakes? What's your take? Obviously, how ridiculous. It's a possibility. Who knows? All right, so here's how it played out. And I'm happy to take your calls, get your input, get your thoughts, and then I'll share mine with you. Obviously, it was 20%. 20%. How ridiculous, 13%. It's a possibility, 44%. And 23% said, who knows? So notice here that 67% combined thought, who can know, or it's a possibility. In other words, not a certain definite response. It was only 33% who had a dogmatic response, either obviously or how ridiculous. I think that's wisdom. All right, we can put the graphic down now. I think that's wisdom. I think that those responses are wise responses. Yes, I could see the obviously part. In other words, California continues to go further and further away from biblical morality and biblical truth and biblical standards and continues to lurch dangerously further or farther left to the point of of openly opposing the faith more and more and openly opposing religious liberties more and more, wanting to radically indoctrinate the kids in the schools more and more. So when you have these earthquakes, like, well, obviously God's trying to get attention. I I could understand that response. How ridiculous, I, I have a little bit harder time understanding that because these types of things are literally jolting. These types of things get attention. These types of things make people think and make people wonder. Is it so ridiculous to say that God is speaking through it? Who knows is fair in in that we do not have an authoritative Bible telling us this. And we didn't have, for example, major prophetic voices in America or 30 or 40 solitary prophetic voices across the country, all prophesying, you watch what happens the beginning of July in California. You watch for a series of earthquakes God's getting the attention of of the state and of the nation. That would have been something. But in the absence of that, it's perfectly fair to say, who knows? But the majority view, it's a possibility. To me, that's the wisest view, barring further divine revelation. Why do I say that? When when you have, say, a, 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 a hurricane, a, a massive act of, a massive manifestation of the power of nature. Let's just say that, okay? 
So whether God's doing it or whether it's the power of nature, which God ultimately created, either way, all right? When you see something happen, that momentous, it is shaking. A, a massive tornado, it is shaking. The earthquake itself, never, never been part of an earthquake in, in terms of anything major on any level, or a tornado where I was really, really close to it. But I've been in a few hurricanes, and it's, it's overwhelming. It's intense. It's, it's, it's devastating. And what it reminds you of immediately is how fragile we are as a human race, that with all of our technology and all of our accomplishments and all that and, and galactic travel and et cetera, we're pretty fragile. I mean, if it just keeps raining and keeps raining and keeps raining, we all die. I mean, that's just the way it is. I remember when Hurricane George came to Pensacola, Florida, and it stalled off the coast and just kept raining and raining and raining. And, and we had where we lived right then in Seminole, Alabama, right over the Florida border into Alabama. Uh, the Styx River overflowed its banks. It was called a hundred year flood, you know, the type of thing you might not see for a century. And it just it happened because the hurricane just stayed there and it kept raining and it kept raining and it kept raining. And next thing, houses were underwater. It was, it was devastating. Something like that just keeps happening long, long enough, we die. So there's something overwhelming about this. And it's the type of thing that gets attention, makes us recognize our frailty, and often causes us to cry out to God. Or it's just like when Rudy Giuliani was running for president, and here he is Catholic, and he made a pro-abortion statement. And as he makes it, lightning hits the building, and, and the, there's a short circuit for a moment. And uh, it got his attention. I mean, he joked about it, but he joked about it in a way where you knew he was serious, too. Like, that's a little unnerving. Now, I am not, I am not, I am not saying that we're supposed to read into every natural disaster and find a spiritual message in it. But certainly, when you have something like this happening, and if, and if the earthquakes keep happening, it, it is an attention getter. It is an attention getter. And at the very least, should cause people to recognize the frailty of the human race and how we need God. And it should remind us that one day everything is going to be shaken. All right, we'll be right back with your calls and a ton more. Stay here. I want to present to you a unique way that you can partner together with me to reach Jewish people with the good news of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Hey, Paul wrote that the gospel is to the Jew first, but many of us don't know how to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. Can I tell you, we have a unique open door and Jewish people are ready to hear, but we need your help. When I was in Israel recently, my last hour in Jerusalem, about a dozen different people came up to me and they wanted to thank me for the impact of our message. One Jewish woman came up to me, a believer in Jesus. She said, you saved my son's life. He was falling away. He was getting pulled by other objections to Jesus. He read your material. He's back in the faith. A young man came up to me. He said he and his Orthodox Jewish friends, here he is, I mean, with the with the yarmulke, the head covering, the traditional Jewish outfit. He said he and his Jewish friends, his Orthodox friends, watch my debates with rabbis. A few years ago, I was able to lead a Holocaust survivor to faith in Jesus. He was a brilliant man, an atheist who had fled the Holocaust. He read my books on answering Jewish objections to Jesus, came to faith, led his wife to the Lord before they left this world. Friends, we have the resources. We have books ready to be translated in Hebrew to be distributed in Israel. We have our Real Messiah website, unique for reaching Jewish people, Orthodox Jews with the gospel, ready to be translated in Hebrew, ready to do internet campaigns to get into every home in Israel. Every cell phone in Israel can have this message, but we need your help. Every gift to our ministry will literally help us reach another Jewish person with the good news of Jesus the Messiah. Go to askdrbrown.org askdrbrown.org and when you go there we will partner together to bring salvation to Israel and the Jewish people together we're making a great difference 
Now is the time to reach the lost sheep of the House of Israel, to share in this end-time harvest of Jewish souls, and to find out how to receive this two-DVD set, Predestination, Election, and the Will of God Debate, go to AskDrBrown.org and click the TV banner. Spiritual Revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the line of fire, 866-34-TRUTH. What if the earthquake was a sign of an outpouring coming? An outpouring of the spirit. I, I know uh, one example of a powerful outpouring that came. And when it came, there was a word that it would be confirmed by two hurricanes coming to that city that had never been hit by two hurricanes in a short period of time. And, and it happened. And there was a powerful outpouring that lasted for years immediately after that. But if it's a positive sign of, of God shaking things, just putting questions out, 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let's start in Wisconsin with Matt. Welcome to the line of fire. Hi, Dr. Brown. Great to chat with you. How you doing? Can you speak right in the phone? A little hard to hear you. Can you hear me better now? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Hey, um, you were just mentioning about this could be the indication of an outpouring of the Spirit. And I, I, I agree with that. Um, back in 1906, before the Azusa Street Revival, Mm-hmm. Um, Frank Bartleman predicted that the, the earthquakes that occurred in San Francisco might have been the hand of God to move people to repentance. Mm. And then, then with the Azusa Street Revival, we had you know, one of the biggest revivals of, of this history period. Mm-hmm. And maybe God is doing that again. Maybe he's getting people ready for an outpouring. Right, so it's a, it's a shaking, but not to say... California's going to hell, but to say California, wake up. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, hey, listen, that's why we, we treat these things with care. I'm not being dogmatic. I'm putting suggestions out as we explore and seek to understand. There are things where I'll, I'll be very dogmatic if I see it plainly written in scripture. And there are things, there are hills I'll die on where I'm really convicted of the Lord about these issues. And then there are others where I'll tread carefully and, and pray and, and listen and interact. All right, uh, let's go to Patricia in Arkansas. Welcome to the line of fire. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, uh, I can have a question for you, and it's kind of an, uh, my opinion, but I, I need your opinion on it. Okay, like in the book of Job, you mentioned when all the things that were placed upon Job, all the miseries and suffering, Satan had to go to God to ask yes how to get God's permission him to do that yes okay okay going back to the like say for instance I know a lot of things are happening around the world but to focus on California but you know I listen to a lot of Christian truthers that's pretty much all I listen to and some really good preachers Mm -hmm. and I've heard from a reliable source that there was a government and a military uh, facility dead center near the Andreas fault that could have possibly caused that earthquake so could it be, in your opinion, that, you know, Satan had to ask God, could he do that? But God allowed it so it would fulfill prophecy. Does that make sense? Oh, oh yeah. So, so a, a few things, Patricia. First, we understand that there are lots of things that happen that are wrong and bad in themselves, but that God explicitly allows because he has a larger purpose, like the crucifixion of his son, Jesus, or Joseph being sold into Egypt and that God even helps orchestrate certain things for a larger purpose. So people will sin and do what they do that's wrong, but then God works through all of that. Now, as for the the military somehow causing an earthquake, uh, that's in in terms of, was it seismology? Whatever the field is, that's completely beyond my pay grade there. I, I don't have any knowledge of that. I've not even heard of a conspiracy theory and I have no idea if the military could do something like that. But the larger question, could militaries in America or other countries engage in war or engage in various acts that would have massive calamitous results that God allows for larger purposes? Yeah, I mean, it happens all the time in that respect, that God allows certain people to do certain things and allows Satan to do certain things Ultimately, God is always at work in the midst of it to carry out his plan as well. Hey, thank you for asking. 
866-34-TRUTH. Let's go over to Jay in Idaho. Welcome to the line of fire. What's your take? Um, so I personally am on the obviously side. Okay. Um, I, I think that is very, uh, I don't know, it's very coincidental, I think, that the, the areas that seem to have the most sin also seem to have the most natural disasters. And not to say that other areas don't have natural disasters, but like New Orleans and Los Angeles and Tokyo seem to be the place, you know, and et cetera, seem to be the places that are constantly hit with these huge ones. Uh, but my question to you is there is a lot of people who think that God just doesn't judge nations in that way anymore. And usually they're questioning it because um, he says he does nothing with um, nothing without the words of his prophets. I don't think I'm wording that correctly, but, you know, without speaking it through his prophets. Yeah, Amos, the third chapter um, says that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, and, and my question to you is, there has, first off, do you think that that is a legitimate interpretation? But second off, there has been many, um, like there was a, uh, somebody who said in 1937 that L.A. would be sunk by an earthquake, and there was William Branham in the 60s saying that it would be sunk by an earthquake. And so my second question is, is it possible that people actually have prophesied the destruction of uh, Los Angeles? Got it. All right. A few things to respond to, and, and thank you for calling. I'm looking at a report from um, Maria, Maria Ruth, excuse me, Maria, Maria Woodworth at a prophecy and the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. And it says there uh, during an 1890 revival meeting in Oakland, California, uh, Maria Woodworth Etter and others predicted a tidal wave and earthquake would occur and destroy the Bay area on April 14th, 1890. People fled the area, but the prediction did not come true. 16 years later, on April 18th, 1906, an earthquake hit the city and left it in ruins. More than 3,000 people died in what reporter Chuck Shee described as a tragic chapter in American history. Uh, one newspaper at the time reported nearly half the city is in ruins and 50,000 are homeless. All right, so second question, is it possible that different prophetic voices have predicted the earthquake but got the timing wrong? Well, that's a big problem. In other words, if you... I declare it's going to happen on a certain time, and it doesn't, that brings reproach to the name of the Lord. It makes the gospel look foolish. The next time you give a warning, people are less apt to hear it. Could it be that they were sensing that God was saying he was going to send an earthquake and then put human interpretation on it? That's possible, but again, it's a dangerous game to play. I don't mean that anyone was playing a game, but that's dangerous. So if if you say God's going to sh- I believe one day God's going to shake California. I believe there's going to be a massive earthquake that just knocks the whole state into the sea. We need to pray and repent. You feel it strongly and you feel to speak it. That's, that's one thing. But when these things don't happen, if they don't happen, or if we date set and we're wrong, it brings reproach to the gospel. And it makes all Christians look bad, not just the ones who prophesied that. And because many Christians don't believe in prophecy like that today. Uh, the other thing is this. Why is it that, say, tornadoes often destroy conservative parts of America? Uh, may, maybe uh, just some, some little community, a trailer community or something like that, and a lot of Christians in it, and, and they get devastated by tornadoes every year. And when I was asking a question about earthquakes and hurricanes years ago, one caller said, well, why is it that for example, the hurricanes tend to come at the same time of the year in the same area, as opposed to having something specifically to do with getting a message out about sin. And for example, Hurricane Katrina, which so devastated New Orleans and such loss of life in that greater region there, it didn't hit the worst part of the city. The most decadent part of the city, from what I understand, was not hit. And then another caller said, well, shouldn't judgment be given in the house of God with all the sin in the church that in the earthquakes and hurricanes be hit in the churches first? So I, th- I think we have to tread carefully when we make some of the larger statements, but I appreciate your, your point and your question. 866-34-TRUTH. I'm going to get to maybe another call or two, and then we're going to switch subjects. But I have no question that God wants the church in America 
to wake up and have a sense of urgency. I have no question that God wants the people of California to wake up and have a sense of urgency and recognize that something is not right. If the earthquakes help, if the earthquakes further stir people and further awaken people, wonderful, all right? I don't want to read too much into it, but I don't want to read too little into it. And if we see things unusual, repeat it, confirmed or in harmony with prophetic words, if we see more and more of this type of thing, then that makes me wonder all the more, should this have my attention? By all means, though, church in America needs to get stirred. The church in America needs to awaken. The church in, in America needs to act, pray, live with a sense of urgency. Our, our nation is really in a mess in so many ways, and the solution is found in the gospel and in the people who know God. And that means really getting on our faces, seeking his face, crying out to him, repenting of sin in our lives, and preaching the gospel boldly, plainly, without fear, with love and compassion to all, come what may. All right, more of your calls, more of my comments. In fact, we'll start with Starbucks when we come back right here on the line of fire. 866-348-7884 is the number to call. All right, we will be right back. You know, we've heard for years now, love is love. Love wins. And I have the right to marry the one I love. And, and maybe you know a gay couple, maybe family members or friends, and they really seem to love each other. Maybe they're raising kids. They love their kids. They're devoted to each other just like a heterosexual couple. You say, surely, love should just accept that and embrace that. And, and many, even, even professing gay Christians, would point to Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Romans chapter 13, verse 10, and that tells us that love does no harm to its neighbor. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. So if I know that telling my neighbor that homosexual practice is sin is going to hurt them, aren't I harming them? If God is love, won't he affirm a loving relationship? All right, let me make this clear. The reason that Scripture opposes homosexual practice and homosexual relations is because God is love. And because God is love, he wants what is best for us. And he didn't make a man to be with a man or a woman to be with a woman. They may be loving, they may be kind, they may be devoted to each other, but God did not make men for men or women for women. God has something better. The first thing is for people to truly know him as Savior and find forgiveness of sins, whatever those sins might be. The second is to find wholeness and completeness in him. I know folks who used to be practicing homosexuals who are now happily married heterosexuals. I know others that used to be practicing homosexuals that are now celibate. They haven't seen a change in their desires, but they love the Lord and they've crucified the flesh and they're fulfilled as single believers. This much I know. If I affirm homosexual practice, if I tell that couple, God bless you, I want to affirm you as a follower of Jesus, I am not helping them, I'm hurting them. The relationship is wrong in God's sight. The relationship is not the best that God has for them. And ultimately, if they come to understand that God is against it, now they're living in open, willful sin. And Scripture makes very plain that those who practice adultery, those who practice fornication, those who practice drunkenness, those who practice homosexuality will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So out of love for those who identify as gay, we tell them God has a better way. And we say, no, he does not bless homosexual practice. You may have desires, you may struggle with those desires, but God does not affirm them. Instead, he says there is forgiveness for every sin committed and there is grace to overcome and lead a life of holiness. And that is the life that will be blessed, a holy life by God's grace.
this week on Leading the Way. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome, friends, to the Line of Fire. This is Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution, a service we seek to provide to each and every one of you. It is a joy and privilege to all those listening on radio, to all those listening later by podcast, to all those watching on Facebook or YouTube live or afterwards, welcome to the broadcast. 866-348-7884. Is God seeking to get the attention of the people in California through these recent earthquakes? You can call away in 866-34-TRUTH. All right, something very interesting and distressing happened over the weekend at a Starbucks in Tempe, Arizona. And according to the reports, Starbucks has since apologized for what happened, but according to the reports, there was a customer there, and he felt, or he or she, the customer felt unsafe because of the presence of five police officers in his or her line of sight. So customer complained, and the barista there at Starbucks, who's also been unidentified, said to the policeman, you can either move away from this customer or leave. They left. Of course, the police union has not been happy with this. As I said, Starbucks apologized for it. Here's, here's what is so striking to me. Here's, what's, here's the most bizarre part of this story. If, if I went into a Starbucks, if I was a coffee drinker and went into a Starbucks, or if I was a fast food eater and I went into a McDonald's, all right, if, if I went to a place like this to sit down and eat or have a cup of coffee, nothing would make me feel more safe than a number of policemen in there at that moment. In other words, I don't feel unsafe to start when I'm in a place like that. But if, in a, if I'm in a place like that, and I'm sitting next to or nearby a bunch of police officers, I'm quite confident nobody's going to rob that place at that moment. I'm quite confident that, that nobody's going to start up some trouble at that moment. If, if anything would make me feel safer in the natural, it would be the presence of officers of the law while I'm there. Yet things are so twisted and upside down today that that's the very thing that makes somebody feel unsafe. Now, I fully understand that there are instances of police brutality in our society. And I fully understand that in certain parts of America, due to difficult relations between the community and the police, that police are not looked at as positively as they might be looked at in other parts of the country. I fully understand that. But I would suggest that if you were an innocent customer, even in those parts of America where where you did not have the best relationship with the police community or where you thought that that there was some type of, of systemic injustice from the police towards your community, I would still think that if you were in a public place and police were there, that you would realize, okay, this is going to reduce the possibility of crime right now This is going to reduce the possibility of some customer going wild because you've got officers of the law sitting there. And yet they have been so demonized in our culture. They have been so looked at as part of the dangerous negative establishment that someone feels unsafe in the presence of police and a Starbucks. How crazy is that? And what's even crazier is that someone at Starbucks either was with the the sympathies of this customer or simply thought they had to comply. But either way, they're rather than telling the customer, sorry, this is a public place, and we're quite glad to have the police here. They are public servants, after all, and risking their lives to keep us safe every day. Aside from saying that, no, 
they ask him to leave. This is crazy. They ask the cops to leave. This is America today. This is the upside down world in which we live. This is how normal has become absolutely abnormal and twisted and turned in a way you can hardly even recognize. Just utterly bizarre. Just, just wanted to say that. Just wanted to say that. 866-34-TRUTH. Let's talk some more about the earthquakes. Dylan in Florida, welcome to the line of fire. Hey, Dr. Brown, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Hey, um, I was going to share with you a prophetic word I believe God gave me when the hurricane hit Houston. And I think it'll kind of go along with what you're saying, if that's okay. Sure. Um, this is the word. Uh, he's got a plan. Sometimes he has to lay things low before he builds up. God will get his glory. He is shaking everything that can be shaken. He is waking us up. The church has been asleep for far too long. He is waking us up from our slumber. He is doing a new thing, getting ready for glory. Uh, that's the prophetic word. And then uh, that was that's when the hurricane hit Houston. I got that word. And then just recently, uh, I don't know, a few couple months ago or so, I came across this scripture in First First Samuel two six through seven. It says, "The Lord kills and brings the life." He brings down the shield and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. And when I had read that, I said, "Wow, that, that kind of goes with the word that I, you know, that I, that I wrote down." So I was just curious of what your thoughts are on that, and uh, you know, yeah, well, you know, well, what do you think about God? Sure, I, I appreciate that. Number one, I have no question that God is shaking the church in America and shaking our nation, and has been doing so in many ways for many years. I have no question about that. I see much biblical precedent for it. We know ultimately God will shake the whole world. Haggai 2 is quoted and applied in, in Hebrews, the end of the 12th chapter, verses 25 to 29. So that that is a, is a given. And I and many, many others have been bringing wake up, shake up, repent messages for many years, coupled with promises of God's love and his desire to move and to bless. That's, that's one thing. The second thing is whether or not there is a direct act of God in the hurricane. In other words, was God specifically sending a hurricane to target Houston? I don't believe that God sits by silently with his arms folded as disasters of this magnitude hit with, with such devastating power and with such terrible loss. So there's something in the midst of this that God certainly wants to say to us, again, at the very least, helping us to recognize how fragile and weak we are and how much we need him. At the same time, we have to be very careful. You know, Chris Vallotton, pastor uh, in California, has said that his, his parents actually moved, if I remember correctly, because of prophecies of this city is going to be destroyed or this is going to happen, that's going to happen. And, and it got him really thinking twice about this whole thing of, of looking at each uh, natural disaster as a judgment from God or listening to all the prophecies. So we just have to tread very carefully when it comes to that. But the general sense of God shaking, speaking, yes, I, I certainly believe he's been doing that and continues to. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let's go to Louise. No, we won't go there. Uh, again, uh, to say this is as simply as I can, I have no question whatsoever that when these natural disasters happen, that God works in them and through them to get our attention, to turn us to prayer, to awaken us to how fragile we are in the shortness of human life. It doesn't mean that he sent it for a specific purpose, I'm not saying he doesn't, but just saying at the very least, this is something that we can certainly deduce. All right, let, let, me, let me give you an example this is some of what's happening in America. I, I wrote an article that's live today on witches, witches everywhere, all right? And, and I stated at the beginning of this article that if you told me uh, 20 years ago that, that I'd write three major books on LGBT themes along with several hundred articles, I would have been quite surprised to say the least. But if you told me just one year ago that I'd be writing an increasing number of articles on the subject of witchcraft, 
not to mention including it as a major theme in a book, I've been, I would have been equally surprised. Witches? Witchcraft, it's not to say that I don't recognize demonic warfare, spiritual warfare, Satan's presence, but it's to say, to focus on it this much, to write on it this much, to emphasize it this much, really? So my book, Jezebel's War with America, Jezebel's War with America, I connect the dots of a lot of what's happening in the world around us from the rise of, I'm speaking specifically in America, the rise of idolatry in America, the rise of sexual immorality, especially through, uh, through pornography, the rise of radical feminism, the rise of the militant pro-abortion movement, the war on gender, the emasculating of men, the silencing of the prophets through fear. This is all Jezebel, meaning the same demonic forces that operated through Jezebel are operating again today. And the rise of witches is one of these things that say, yeah, radical feminism, witchcraft, these things tie in. Let me, let me just refer to a, a few headlines. I cite these uh, in the article, all right? But, but let me just uh, point these out. Some of the headlines I referred to in this article, just, just from the last few days or all within the last month, uh, for example, June 24th story in the National Catholic Register, the witches are back. Begins with this, witchcraft in its modern feminist occult packaging seems to be a misguided response to the profound questions that dog our age. It's the wrong answer to the right question. July 3rd, Daily Beast, Sidney Loof murder suspect acted as daddy vampire to cult of witches, according to a witness. Uh, June 6th, op-ed piece in the New York Times. Here's what being a witch really means. And then it explains that witch is one of the words that self-described witch now uses to describe herself, but its meaning varies depending on context. At any given time, it can signify that I'm a feminist, someone who celebrates freedom for all, who fight against injustice, et cetera, et cetera. All right? And, and she uses her magic for her purposes. July 2nd story, AFP, French designer Julian Fourny hailed witches as proto-feminist trailblazers who send shivers through the patriarchy. June 18th headline, Los Angeles Times, witches at work. These women just want you to be your best self. And this witch says half my business is being on Instagram. Witches arising everywhere in the culture and the media celebrating the rise of witches. Friends, this is the spirit of Jezebel. Let's open our eyes. God wants to wake up America to this reality. If you haven't yet ordered Jezebel's War with America, go here right now, Jezebel's warwithamerica.com. The book comes out less than 30 days. Pre-order and get $50 of free materials. Jezebel's warwithamerica.com. You know, we talk about scriptures being the word of God. It's also clear they were written by human beings. That, that Paul tells Timothy, hey, please bring my cloak. You know, it's going to be cold here in the winter when I'm in prison. And it's interesting that when Ezekiel says, thus saith the Lord, that his words come out different than when Isaiah says, thus saith the Lord, or Jeremiah says, thus saith the Lord. So how do we explain that? Is the Bible written by God or men? 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All scripture is breathed out by God. How can it be breathed out by God and yet come in so many different human forms? Someone used this analogy once. When the light shines through a window, that the, the light on one side of the window is slightly different than on the other side. What if the light shined through colored glass? Now it's going to come out very different on the other side. But what if God, who made the light, also made the glass so that through the multicolored panels on that glass window, that stained glass window, the light came out on the other side just the way he intended. So yes, of course, the Bible is full of humanity. It's full of human emotion. The Bible is full of human expression and human vocabulary and human distinctives from one culture to another. And yet it is breathed out by God so that we get the very word of God, just what God wanted to communicate to us 
we get in an absolutely inspired, infallible form. So yes, it is the word of God through man, but inspired by God, breathed out by God. So we can say the scriptures are the word of God. International speaker and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. It is one of my goals to be a son of Issachar. First Chronicles 12, 32, the sons of Issachar, 200 leaders from all their tribes. They were men in David's army that gathered together with him in Hebron to stand with him for the kingdom. And they understood the times and knew what Israel should do. That's one of my goals, and I believe throughout the church, especially leaders, we need to be sons of Issachar, those who understand the times and know what God's people should do. Not just have a fascination with end-time events, not just have a fascination with prophecy, but understand what's happening in a culture and therefore how we as God's people should respond. What is God doing? What are the people doing? What is Satan doing? And how should we respond? Many times we have looked at the outward and failed to understand what was happening behind the scenes. I I always use the counterculture revolution of the 60s as a primary example. So we know there was a radical shift in America and other countries in the 60s. We know, as psychologist David Myers pointed out around the year 2000, that if you fell asleep in 1960 and woke up in 2000, that you'd wake up to the divorce rate doubled and teen suicide tripled and reported violent crime up four times and prison population up five times and children born out of wedlock up six times and people living together out of wedlock up seven times. The great majority of that shift happened in a short period of time in the 60s. And we know that there is the characterization of the 60s as the time of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was a time of rebellion. It was a time of the flesh. It was a time of, of, of all types of ungodly movements and activities. That's the time during which I became a heavy drug user from 69 to 71 before coming to faith late in 71. So there's no denying what happened. There's no denying the rebellion. There's no denying the flesh. There's no denying the sin. There's no denying the negative influence of Eastern religion and coupled with drugs and rock music and immorality. And there was a major cultural shift and and we are reaping the fruit of it to this day. At the same time, something else was going on. At the same time, there was a cry from young people looking for more. At the same time, they were asking spiritual questions. They were wondering about the purpose of meaning of life. They were shaken by the assassinations, JFK and Martin Luther King and RFK in 63 and 68. They, they were shaken by the prospect of being shipped off to war in Vietnam for what purpose or just to die there. They had a lot of questions as we were now prospering and rebuilding after the the war years and stability coming to America and more and more young people being born and more, more young people going to college. They were asking more and more questions. Why are we here? What's, what's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? They were asking good questions, but to my understanding, the church of the day was not seeing, by and large, the spiritual seeking of the young people, recognizing what they were looking for and asking about. Instead, the church was more aware of, look at all the evil, look at all the rebellion, look at all the sin. This must be the last days. Jesus must be coming any minute. All the prophecies are coming to pass. We're out of here soon. Rather than saying, what a right moment in history. What a perfect time in history. What a time for the gospel to go forward. Young people asking about the meaning of life young people asking spiritual questions. Now, it's true that many young people wrote off traditional religion. Ah, the church, they have the same old answers. In the synagogue, they have the same old answers. We don't care about that. And they were looking at other places. But wisdom could have come from the church at that time to go where people were, young people, all right, and and say, hey, 
you want something radical, you want new life, you want the meaning of life, check out the teachings of Jesus. And in fact, Jesus became very popular in the hippie movement as, as the most radical counterculture revolutionary of all, joined with a message of peace and love. Now, when you bring in the whole message with repentance, holiness, the cross, and, and you preach to people who are now bound in sin, sexual sin, drug addiction, and, and, and other things, alcoholism, and, and are now messing up their own lives, it, it was a very ripe time. That's why when the Jesus People movement began around 67 and, and came to a head in the early 70s, that's why so many hundreds of thousands of hippies and radicals and rebels around the world came to faith. But for the most part, only a small part of the church was aware of what was happening. And the majority seemed to judge primarily by outward things and missed a massive opportunity of harvest. It's the same thing today. We can't just look at everything that's wrong in America, and there's a lot that's wrong. And, and we can look at the radical left and the radical right, and we can see the division in the country, and we can see the wrong direction of the country, the war on gender, something that foundational, the indoctrinating of our young people, the attack on the institution of marriage, the seduction of the nation through porn. We can see all these things and, and recognize what's happening on the bad side, but is there something else going on? Are, are young people crying out for justice, but they're just misguided in what they're doing? Are, are people recognizing that, that America is not the ultimate hope and the president is not the ultimate hope and there must be more? Is there something else going on behind the scenes spiritually that we need to take hold of? That's my appeal. Let us not just judge by what our eyes see. Let us be on our faces with the scriptures open saying, God, give us wisdom, give us insight, give us spiritual understanding. Help us to recognize what the enemy is doing. That's why to me, it's important to connect the dots and recognize the same demonic forces that operated through Jezebel 3,000 years ago are operating again today through many others. That's why it's important for us to be alert spiritually so that we are vigilant and recognizing the war that we're in at the same time, I believe it's harvest time, the increase in, in depression and suicide among young people, the increasing isolationism they feel through social media and things like that, and people just getting separated, the ugly hostility of the world around them. Many still looking for something authentic, community, if the church could be the real deal, and in so many places it is doing just that, I believe young people and old will come flocking to Jesus in our day. 866-34-TRUTH. Let us go over to Jordan in Oklahoma. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Hi, Dr. Brown. Um, I, I was just calling uh, in today. I, I just want to let you know, I just recently found your ministry. I want to tell you how much I loved it. Um, Thank you. I, I'm a, tw I'm a 27 year old pastor and, uh, I am very familiar with the uh, ministries of David Wilkerson and uh, Leonard Ravenhill, and so I automatically uh, flock to your ministry. Uh, just real quick, I'm I'm from California, but moved to Oklahoma a few years ago, and uh, as my heart longs for revival greatly, uh, I've pushed my church to go door knocking and do a lot of evangelism, and uh, we have found exactly what you're saying right now. Um, even in the midst of the Bible Belt, we have ran into zero atheists, but uh, probably three or four witches. And uh, it is amazing to see the demonic influence just within our community. Mm. Um, but I wanted to get your opinion also on uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 22, which says, The creation, God's creation, groans or even moans, um, waiting for the redemption of God's creation. And, and I think you're absolutely correct as far as trying to see through the lens of God's judgment on each individual case. But I look at it and see God's creation or even the earth uh, moaning, uh, groaning over the sin that's being taken place, um, almost as uh, Abel's blood crying out for sin. I see almost the earth crying out also 
for the sin that's taking place within it. And so I uh, just wanted to get your thoughts and tell you again how much I, I love your ministry. So. Well, thank you, sir. And when you mention Leonard Ravenhill and you mentioned David Wilkerson, men that I had the privilege of working closely with and who deeply impacted my life, uh, yes, there is a legacy that is so different from so much of our contemporary Christianity here in America. And, and it calls us to get on our knees and on our faces. That internet message, yeah. there's an abbreviated version, uh, Anguish by David Wilkerson, uh, just 10 minutes yeah. long, rips at all of our hearts. And it doesn't take me long if I take out While Revival Tarries by Brother Len and start reading that I'm immediately challenged on my knees. So yes, may we, we seek God afresh, humble ourselves in repentance before him and ask him to have mercy on our life. He desires to. And yes, Romans 8 certainly applies that when you, the world, as amazing as it is, and as much as it sustains the human race, it is still uh, a world that is gradually deteriorating and falling apart. And yes, there are times, like Leviticus 18, God says if, if people in the land persist in, in serious sexual sin and immorality, that the land will vomit them out. So there can be these literal things, even literal earthquakes that do that. But just on the larger scale, the earth is crying out, the, the, the world, the animal creation, crying out for the revealing of the sons of God, meaning that when God's people are fully revealed as his people, walking in his glory and in resurrection power, that means the redemption of planet earth, how we all long for that to happen. Hey friends, partner with us, stand with us. Go to patreon.com forward slash ask Dr. Brown. Take 30 seconds and go there now. If you enjoy the broadcast, please do that. Thank you.